Hello everyone, I'm Paul McGuire Grimes. 2023 was a really big year at the movies. We had the Barbenheimer double feature with people going to the theater dressed as Barbie, Ken, and yes, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Audiences loved seeing movies like the Super Mario Brothers and the new Little Mermaid back up on the big screen. And the horror genre did really well this year with movies like Scream 6 and Five Nights at Freddy's. I started a new movie series at the Imagine in theaters and Egan where I bring contemporary and classical movies back to the big screen and then do a discussion after every one of them and you just had really good movies in theaters this year. We had people returning to theaters for the first time since the pandemic and it was just so great to see. And did I mention Taylor Swift? Audiences came in droves to go see Taylor Swift's The Eras Tour in the movie theater and that was after they already went to the actual concert. Such a great time to go to the movie theater this year. So without further ado, this is my top 10 movies of 2023. This is Paul's Trip to the Movies. Coming in at number 10 is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. The Spidey sequel managed to up the ante with its dazzling and really groundbreaking animation. I mean, every frame of that movie was just a stunning work of art, offering different mediums and styles and animation styles, sometimes all within the same frame. Now, I want to tell you, buckle up, as this movie moves at a mile a minute. You may need multiple viewings just to catch everything that's going on in this movie. And it's jam-packed, just geeky goodness with a fantastic voice cast from Shamik Moore, ha Haley Steinfeld, Brian Tyree Henry, and Oscar Isaac, just to name a few of this really big cast. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is now streaming on Netflix. Coming in at number nine is Air. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck are prove again that they are just a dream team together. Ben Affleck directed the film and stars in it about the creation of the Nike Air Jordan shoe. It is just riveting. And Affleck really, I think, matched the urgency in the story while keeping this a really lean and to the point movie. Like any good coach, he knows and he trusts his cast and the instincts that they have, really letting them just kind of run in any scene. From Matt Damon to Jason Bateman to Viola Davis delivering the slam dunk monologue as really the heart and soul of this movie. Air is now streaming on Prime Video. Coming in at number eight is American Fiction. Now, Cord Jefferson makes a really strong directorial debut with American Fiction, which won the Audience Award at the Toronto International Film Festival and was named Best Picture at the Twin Cities Film Fest. Jeffrey Wright is incredible as this author really facing an existential crisis when he's told that his work isn't black enough. The film is prime satire at its best, with its funny and just painful reminder, but the expectations that come that we're faced with, with our art, our work, family, and who can tell what stories. American fiction is now playing in select theaters. Number seven is a movie that I watched recently that just blew me away, and that is The Iron Claw. It's the story of the Von Erich wrestling family, and it's really brought to the big screen thanks to writer-director Sean Durkin, who tells the story, I think, with really great passion and drive. Uh, it's a really daunting and huge story to tell, and he really pulled it together really well narratively. Now, I don't think that you have to be a fan of wrestling to find yourself really engrossed in this story. I was not familiar with this family, the Von Erich family, so my jaw was literally on the floor over and over again with every shocking and tragic moment that seems to happen to them. It's a really powerful ensemble that's really anchored by Zac Efron giving the best performance of his career. And he's joined by Holt McCallany, Stanley Simons, Jeremy Allen White, Harris Dickinson, and more tyranny. The Iron Claw is in theaters now. Coming in at number six is Saltburn. Now, writer-director Emerald Fennell's follow-up to Promise Young Woman has that same bite and is just another wild ride. It stars Barry Keoghan as Oliver and Jacob Elordi as Felix, these two University of Oxford students 
who decide to go back to Felix's family estate for the summer. And it becomes a summer that they never forget. Now, Kyogen gives really brilliantly calibrated performance as Oliver next to Jacob Lordy, who's just really sexy and just eye-popping on screen as Felix. Finale has crafted this really dazzling, dizzying, wicked sense of lust and lies and betrayal. And it has this gorgeous cinematography by Lena Sandgren that just channels, I think, the kind of visual jolt that we saw with directors like Stanley Kubrick. Saltburn is now streaming on Prime Video. Number five is Bradley Cooper's latest film, Maestro. Bradley Cooper spent six years prepping and working on his Leonard Bernstein biography. He directed, co-wrote, stars, and produces the film. And while the film certainly spans many decades and he could have told a really expansive story, he really distills it down to the love story between him and his wife Felicia Montalegro, who's played by Carrie Mulligan. Cooper, I think, really understands the musicality in his films, and it's really matched also by the cinematography by Matthew Lee Batik. It's a stunning work for him as a director and storyteller, on top of giving an incredible performance as Leonard Bernstein. And Carrie Mulligan also just gives one of my favorite performances of the year as Felicia. She'll just rip your heart out with the, the, the ache and the pain and also the life that she brings to Felicia. Uh, you can now see Maestro on Netflix. Coming in at number four is Killers of the Flower Moon. Martin Scorsese's latest has been adapted by the David Grand book of the same name. And he invites you into the community of the Osage indigenous people in Oklahoma and the staggering story of murders within their community. It's a moment of time that's not often talked about. And Scorsese and his creative team are trying to give them their voice and give them their culture and showcase that loss of community. Lily Gladstone is remarkable as Molly Burkhart, whose life is really turned upside down with the murders of her family members. Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro give some of their best performances in years under Martin Scorsese's direction. And you know, the three of them have been working together. Leo and Marty have been working together for a long time. And this movie marks 50 years between the collaborations between Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese dating back to Mean Streets. I just love watching their work together on screen. Killers of the Flower Moon has all the themes that Scorsese has wrestled with over the years, like culture, identity, religion, and just the evil within us. Killers of the Flower Moon is now in select theaters, but look for it on Apple TV Plus soon. Coming in at number three is Barbie. The biggest movie of the year is also one of the best movies of the year. And like I said, it was so great to see people just heading to the theater in droves to see what writer-director Greta Gerwig masterfully created. It stars Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling, who brought Barbie and Ken to life with vibrancy and just these really clever performances. Um, and the movie had an amazing production design and the costumes that just took Barbie to a whole nother level. It was endlessly enjoyable from start to finish and had some really fun bangers like Dua Lipa's Dance the Night Away to I'm Just Ken to Billie Eilish's deeply moving What Was I Made For, which I think will get her her second Oscar. Uh, now, the Barbenheimer double feature will never be forgotten about in film history. I guarantee you that. Now, coming in at number two is the other half of the Barbenheimer double feature, which is Christopher Nolan's biggest film to date with Oppenheimer. Nolan set out to tell the story of scientist and physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer and the creation of the atomic bomb. Nolan takes a film about science and technology and turns it into this political legal fight, really asking the audience about the ethical nature of all of it. He and his creative team are really firing on all cylinders to tell this story. He and cinematographer Hoyt von Hoytema utilized large format IMAX cameras and 65mm film to tell this story in both black and white sequences and in color. It features an incredible ensemble with Killian Murphy giving one of the best and nuanced performances of the year as J. Robert Oppenheimer. Emily Blunt was terrific as his wife Kitty, and Robert Downey Jr. Uh, just reminds us of the power that he has on screen with his portrayal of Levi Strauss. 
Now, Nolan jam packs this film, and yet there's still so much story to be told with the aftermath that he just didn't get a chance to tell. There's so much to take into that it might need a multiple viewings just to look at it through different angles and different lenses each time. Oppenheimer is now in theaters. Coming in at number one is, I think, um, a movie that for me took me by surprise. And I think that sometimes that the best movies are the ones that sneak up on you. You don't know what happened, what you're about to expect, and it just hits you in really unexpected ways and sits with you for days afterwards. For me, that movie, which is coming in at number one, is All of Us Strangers. It stars Andrew Scott as a lonely gay man who has a sexual encounter with his neighbor. They then start to fall in love, and he finds himself going back to his hometown, his childhood home, where he seems to have conversations with his parents who passed away 30 years earlier. Director Andrew Haig presents this really haunting story of forgiveness, acceptance, and love. All of the Strangers works on so many different levels, with him, I think, really allowing the audience to interpret this film with whatever lens or personal history that they bring to us. It's just ripe for discussion afterwards about the, what the reality really is for Andrew Scott's character, Adam. The title plays on so many different levels, too, on what's the meaning of, and if Andrew is a stranger to himself, his parents, his lover, and I think it's really grounded by a deeply personal uh, performance from Andrew Scott, who's joined by the mesmerizing Paul Mescal, Claire Foy, and Jamie Bell. It's now in select theaters and will be in wide release on January 15th. That is my top 10. Let's go through those again. Number 10 is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Number 9 is Air. 8 is American Fiction. 7, The Iron Claw. 6, Saltburn. 5, Maestro. 4, Killers of the Flower Moon. 3, Barbie. 2, Oppenheimer. And my number one movie of the year is All of Us Strangers. I do want to give some honorable mentions to movies that also stuck with me. Movies like May, December, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1, Past Lives, and The Holdovers. I want to hear from you. What have been some of your favorite movies of this year? Follow me on social media at Paul's Movie Trip. Leave me a comment on social media or on YouTube. What has been some of your favorite movies? And don't forget, I do a monthly movie series at Imagine Theaters. This has been such a fun experience. Coming up January 28th is All the President's Men. February is Dr. Strangelove. March, it's Good Will Hunting. And I'm going to be doing some more interviews coming up in 2024. And I had a great time. So check out my YouTube channel as well for interviews with people like Margot Robbie, Emerald Fennell, Michael B. Jordan, Adam Sandler, Jennifer Aniston, just to name a few. It's been a really terrific year at this movie. So thank you so much for watching my top 10 movies of 2023. This is Paul's trip to the movies.